Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God and our Mother, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Welcome back to Fireside with Fathers. It's great to see you all out there. Um, just a reminder, we have our documentary, I Am Fire, on Father Henry, premiering on Wednesday, the Feast of the Immaculate Conception. So please uh, tune in. So the more people that are watching it at the same time helps the algorithm. Um, if this is also helping you, subscribe to kind of do a bit of evangelization and formation. That's the idea. And it's getting to us that a lot of people are watching this, Father. Um, like the numbers are one thing really like we don't really like follow all the numbers but like the people that would write us and the people that would thank us just for formation sake and it's just they are helpful so so pray for us keep us in the prayers I and it's it's good to know that so like if you guys can get the message out there but um tonight father jeff you sent me on a little article there about um the dark winter in uh pennsylvania it was a headline i think it was like a Maybe people were using too much electricity or whatever, and lights were going to go out. But uh, it's also a term that you mentioned in the last fireside we were together. So do you want to just start with that, like this whole dark winter thing, like what that is, just to sure. kick it off? Sure. I think, uh, I, think, I think the way to start is to say, well, why, why is this term dark winter now being used? Of course, I used it last time when we were discussing things. And this morning, as I look at the headlines, there's this article that says a dark winter might be coming for Pennsylvania. And of course, it's speaking about gas and oil prices and people heating their homes or people getting electricity in their homes for light. But this term, the dark winter, it's it's a planted word. It's It, it has a meaning. And perhaps if I just take a step back, when I was in college, I had the opportunity to take a class from a history professor who, in the 1960s and 1970s, he worked for the State Department. And one of his jobs was to prepare people, was to write press releases for the State Department, helping to prepare people for things that were going to happen in a year or two. And so, for example, he explained to us how one of the th things that he was involved in was helping to write press releases that had headline suggestions in them, getting people ready for the opening of the West to China by the Nixon administration. And that, that for me, that, those classes for me, I think that was my first real introduction to, you can't say election fraud, maybe you could say election fortification. <laughs> Smallpox, we'll get to that. <clears throat> uh, but that was my first introduction to this reality, which I think is, it's a reality that oftentimes as Catholics, we, we're, we're not, I think, I think, well, how could I say this? Catholic leadership, Catholic intellectual leadership in Western Europe and the United States, it hasn't been that adept at helping lay people become educated, helping lay people and clerics, helping everybody become educated in, in the use and the misuse of journalism, in the use and the misuse of propaganda, in influencing states and societies and of course, when he, when this professor mentioned this at the time in the early 1990s, he actually did it for us in the context of explain. He showed us in the course of this class that I was taking. He often did it by anecdotes, but he he showed us how <clears throat> propaganda was being, how the government was using propaganda in order to get us into what we now know as the first Gulf War. And he kind of explained to us how it's, it's not that difficult, or perhaps the, the means, we, we know the means that we have. 
Like the government knows the means that it has at its disposal in order to condition society in one way or the other. This is not a new phenomenon either. We know from the study of philosophy, Joe before, but you know, for certainly you and I have discussed it in Rome, <clears throat> how there was there was this real debate that took place in in the Greek world from 450 BC to 320 BC. There was this debate that really took place between the sophists on the one hand and the realists, I call them the realists, Plato, Aristotle, Socrates, on the other hand, over what kind of education is needed for a society to flourish, to be happy, to live according to the common good. And we could go into that debate more if you wanted to, but the essential position of the sophists was that uh, there's no ultimate truth, there's no ultimate reality. And therefore, we need to learn how to organize society, essentially using the equivalent of bread and circus, identifying, if we can't find one, making up some great enemy that we can get the citizens to fear. And if we can get these citizens to fear death, for the most part, then we can use bread and circus and we can use entertainment and rhetoric in order to condition them to act according to our interests. Our interests being, well, the interests of the few, the oligarchs, who rule society from behind the scenes. And I think in Catholic circles, I was, well, I was thinking about this. There might be a number of reasons for this. Some might not be so bad. I was just listening to uh, uh, a description a few, a few days ago about how well, you know, in many Catholic countries, up until the 1950s, there wasn't a whole lot of time actually for leisure. Not that we were against leisure, it's just that many Catholic countries, many, I, I'm thinking of the, the Catholic immigrants here in the United States, the Irish, more so the Irish probably than the Germans, but the Irish, the Polish, the Italians, they came from societies which were Catholic. But a lot of the... Catholics in this country were working class. They spent from early in the morning till late at night working. <laughs> and there wasn't a whole lot of time for leisure. And certainly there, whole, there wasn't a whole lot of effort put into how can we be the ones who create culture or who create leisure? So a lot of Catholic education up until even recently, up until even now, a lot of it is geared towards work. And it's only in the last generation or two that we've really had leisure time or where we do intellectual work or where our education is not exclusively dedicated towards practical matters. And I just say that to say that that could be one of the reasons why we're a little bit naive about the, the sophist dimension of education. In the Greek world, by the time you get to the 320s BC, the sophists had basically exiled. They had canceled Socrates and Plato and Aristotle. There was cancel culture back then as well. And essentially, I mean, one sign of this, for example, if you if you think to if you think to the life of St. Augustine, St. Augustine was known as the principal, as the great one of the greatest teachers of rhetoric during his time in the Roman Empire. He came of age as a great teacher of rhetoric. Why? It's because it's because rhetoric became the primary the primary means of education in the ancient world. It's because in order to run first the Greek Empire by Alexander or later on the Roman Empire there wasn't really an emphasis given to the truth. I mean Pilate <laughs> punches Pilate, right? When he's speaking with Jesus Christ at his trial. And the question of the truth comes up. Pilate asks very skeptically, what is truth? What is that? 
One of the reasons for that is that there was a basic consensus. There was a basic consensus that there really was not an ultimate truth. Maybe some people made claim to it, but there was a skepticism about the gods. And there was a kind of idea that, well, what really matters is blood and empire and building roads and technology and systems and science. <clears throat> And of course, from I think from 300 or so until the modern era, you especially in Catholic countries, there is a there is a, a predominance in education to the pursuit of the truth and conforming our lives with the truth. Even if we have to spend a lot of time working, well, we also have this confidence that the te that the church is a teacher of the truth, and that we can live in harmony with the truth by following the teachings of the church. This has all changed. And I think in the United States, we see this especially in the in the early 20th century. I one I've mentioned him before, the writings of Thorstein Veblen. Veblen describes how when in Veblen in his book Theory of the Leisure Class or in his other book Absentee Ownership, he describes how governments are no longer simply speaking governments in the sense of, we, we think of government as we go to elections, we elect our representatives or our president, they put judges in power, and they serve our interest and the interests of the common good. And what Veblen points out, and many thinkers pointed this out, many good social scientists pointed this out throughout the 20th century, is that that kind of classic model of government, it doesn't account for the reality of the leisure class or absentee owners. And who are these people? Right? These people are, in many countries, it's wealthy families. But Veblen says, well, in, in, this, in the modern world, in the so-called global world, we also see that there are, there are groups and interests and forces, if you want to call them that, who are wealthier than any government, who are able to operate using the financial resources at their disposal and the companies that they make and the mechanisms of finance that they develop, they're able to operate at a level where they themselves can start to control governments. In other words, Veblen described in his works how in the, in the modern world we have a new form of collaboration that's taking place between the wealthy and governments behind the scenes that very much models the sophist model of government and education of the ancient world. It's no, it's no surprise that the First World War, we start to see great collaboration taking place, great interest in propaganda. All of, the, all of the countries that were involved in the First World War, and perhaps the country that was the most effective in implementing propaganda against its population to get them into the First World War was the United States. The, the, there was a, there was a I, forget the, I forget the exact name of the institution now, but we could find it out very easily. But Walter Lippmann was one of the individuals who was put in charge of war propaganda for the United States. And he and his team, they, they went through all instruments of culture from ev going even like to the use of sporting events as a way of encouraging the development of nationalism, interest in the war and propaganda in the, in the first world war. So what we see happening in the First World War, what gets put together is that there is this, there is this kind of collaborate, there's a real social collaboration that starts to take place between powerful financial interests and corporations, governments, and what we would call media and communications. This a lot of it gets gets done in the First World War, and then in, in the United States, it gets kind of put by the side, cast aside after the First World War. But with, in the in the run up to the Second World War, it all gets put back in place. And then 
after the Second World War, once we get into the Cold War, it it not only gets put back in place, it gets institutionalized into government. So by the late 1970s, early 1980s, there's a, there's a host of books written in the social sciences and in political science about the dangers of interest groups uh, on democracy and on self-government. And most of these books in the 70s and 80s, by the way, they were written by leftists, which is ironic given the times that we're in, where you generally have leftists oriented companies coming out of Silicon Valley, for example, or Wall Street, who are now the ones co-opting government and co-opting governmental policies in their interest. It's almost like there's been a complete takeover, <laughs> right? <clears throat> and again, we could, we, we could say much more about everything that I've just outlined, but that's all the backdrop for introducing us to this term, dark winter. Where does this term dark winter come from? And I, all I can do is I can give you my own, my own story and how I discovered the term dark winter and why I think it's now in this headline that, you, that we read this morning about what's happening in Pennsylvania this year. So we all know that in March, February, March, and April of 2020, there was something that hadn't really happened in living memory <laughs> that happened to us. was this, sometimes it's called the Spanish flu. I know some people, they prefer to call it the Kansas flu. But at the end of the First World War, there was this epidemic that took place. And I think you and I, we grew up in a time where we, we thought, I know, I know in February of 2020, I had this Augustine had this term, by the way, living memory, right? Living memory is the memory that people have that you know, that you have met in your life. So for example, if you know someone, if you have a grandfather or a grandmother and you were able to spend some time with that person while you were growing up, what that person could tell you is, is part of living memory, right? So I don't know, my grandmother, my grandfather was born in 1900. And when I was with my grandmother in the last couple years of her life, she lived until 2010 or so. She would tell us stories and she, she would have memories and she would tell us about memories. Like she, at one point she said, I remember as a little four or five year old girl sitting on the lap, uh, sitting on the lap of my great grandfather who died at 111. And so we all thought, well, that's, that's pretty cool, right? Here we are in 2009 talking to grandma, and she remembers in 1910 sitting on the lap of her great-grandfather who died at 111. I mean, we're, we're right there. We can go back to the 18th century. I mean, that, I mean so th th that's kind of the notion a little bit of living memory. And I think when everything started in when everything started in the spring of of 2020, a lot of us were we were going on living memory, in the sense of this is something that hadn't really happened to us until until just recently, right? Or, or, sorry, for for a long time, it's not part of our experience growing up. The most it is is it's part of our living memory, <clears throat> and. Of course, we all start doing research, and I came across this this great this great journalist, and I highly recommend. I'm going to take a step back here. In the late 1990s, I had a mentor named John Geegan. He's he's dead now. And John Geegan taught political philosophy. From he, I think he got his PhD from the University of Chicago in the late 1950s or early 1960s. And from that time on, he taught political philosophy at several universities on the West Coast and in the Midwest. And John told me something that I thought was very helpful in the late 1990s. In the late 1990s, he said, the United States has become 
it's, it's definitive now. The United States is an empire. If the United States is an empire, then the media is going to become the imperial media. Right? In the imperial media, you have a kind of collaboration that's taking place, either covertly or overtly, between the organs of government, the businesses that are closest aligned with the government, and the media corporations themselves. That the media is going to become like the town criers of the Roman Empire. Right? The, the Roman Empire would send criers into the town four, five, six times a day to give the news. And of course, it's much easier to, to give them the message <laughs> and make sure they give the message you want them to give if you're hiring the town crier. So John said, John said, at this point, the media is essentially going to be an organ of information for the government, and it's going to mix in truth and lies in everything that it says. So... What's important for us to do if we want to get to the truth is that we just have to accept that this is the way the media, this is the imperial media. <clears throat> we just have to accept it. And then we have to try to find people who make it their business, make it their job to read the different organs of the media, to read different journalists in order to try to cut through the lies to get to the truth of what's going on. And I think at that point, based on what my professor, my history professor in the early 1990s had told me, and also based on the respect that I had for John, I kind of took him, took him at his word. And John said, what we should do at this point, if we're going through the media, is we should try to find these individuals who make it their job to get to the truth. And you're going to find them in, in surprising places. <clears throat> and so after the second, after the second Iraq war, uh, one fellow, I, I read a book. Well, I, another thing, another, just another note here. <laughs> I think another note here as far as my own experience. I saw an opinion piece, I think it was in the New York Times, but I, I can't remember if whether it was the New York Times or the Wall Street Journal. But in the early 2000s, I saw an opinion piece where this fellow was writing a review of Hilaire Belloc's book, The Free Press. And Belloc wrote The Free Press in the early 1900s. And what is, what is the thesis of Belloc's book? Belloc's book is saying that Belloc says, in every town I go to, I now realize there's two kinds of presses. There's two kinds of media. There are the big newspapers. And the big newspapers, because of advertising and because of the interests that governments have in what the big newspapers say, the big newspapers are almost always lying. They're almost always saying half-truths. They're always saying someone else's story. And they're really more in the business of coaxing the population in one direction or another, not really getting to the truth of matters. So Belloc wrote in his book, The Free Press, wherever I go to a new town, I immediately go to these small, independent presses that are always short of money, are sometimes narrowly focused on one or two issues. They tend to be cranky. They don't have resources. So they have to do a lot of reading and trying to cut through lies in order to get what's what to what's true. And this whoever wrote this article, this opinion piece in the New York Times or the Wall Street Journal, he said, I think the internet's gonna be just at just like Hilaire Belloc's book described, at least for the next 20 years or so before they clamp down on the internet and shut down what would be the what will be the new free press and and so the new free press are these small oftentimes small sometimes cranky sometimes you know short of money one issue focused but what we see happening in in these in these smaller institutions is that there are some people that 
while they do focus on on one while they do focus on one topic or a few topics there are some of them who they're able to get enough money they're able they're they're so dedicated they're able to kind of start to get to the truth of things and there are a lot of these small independent i guess now it's called the alt media that they are able to get to the more or less to the truth on a number of matters so there's this one journalist who I highly recommend right now. Her name is Whitney Webb, and she has a site called uh, Limited Unlimited, Unlimited Hangout. And she's done a series of articles in the last three or four years related to the times that we're in. And it was it was it was in March or April of 2020 that she wrote an article called "The Dark Winter." And what she points out. What she points out in her, in her, it's not, and it wasn't, in the end, it wasn't just one article. It was three articles on the dark winter, the darkest winter, Robert Cadillac, and a number of other characters. And what she points out in her articles is that, first of all, this, there was a, maybe just to, if we go to one point, in 2001, <clears throat> There was a team led by Robert Cadleck that did a, did a scenario called the Dark Winter. And what, what they did in this scenario of the Dark Winter is that they, they, imagined a, they imagined a smallpox attack, a biological weapon small ta- smallpox attack on the United States and an outbreak that came from it. And I could say more about that. I have some notes here that I've taken on it. But we could also just like people go to the article that Whitney Webb wrote. But in the smallpox attack, well, there's a number of things that happen that they that they roll out in the scenario. So, for example, they imagine shutting the country down, preventing travel between borders of the United States and other countries. They imagine lockdown. They imagine coming up with a vaccine. They imagine getting everybody to take the vaccine in order to go back to normal life again. And so what Webb points out in her articles is that this this dark winter scenario, it was kind of like a little baby of Robert Cadillac. But Webb points out something else in her in her articles and in the interviews that she she did several interviews about the articles that she wrote, and these can be also found fairly easily on the internet. But what Webb points out is that Cadillac has, has had a history. He got very involved in bioweapons, going back to the first Iraq war, going back to the time when my history professor was giving us these lectures at the first Iraq war about how narrative trumps everything <laughs> Right, and he was explaining to us how they were going to blame weapons of mass destruction, destruction on Saddam Hussein, when just as a way of stoking fear, so that we would go to war against Saddam Hussein during the first during the first Iraq War, right? So all these things, and then also, uh, Webb points out in her articles that well, in beginning in the in the 1990s, you start to see uh, novels written with biological weapons scenario. I, I think there was one novel that was passed around the Clinton administration called Cobra Event. Like once again, where there's kind of a smallpox scenario, some sort of a biological terror outbreak. There was another scenario that was played out of China poisoning the cornfields of the United States. And all the, and, and Robert, so this fellow Robert Cadillac, and again, we're not just picking on him, because there's there's many characters like him, but he, but I think one of the reasons Webb also points out points to Robert Cadillac is that Robert Cadillac was given a position in the Trump administration in 2017 in order to deal with things like biological weapon outbreaks or pandemics or epidemics or things like this. <clears throat> but there's another there's another little piece of the puzzle here. And another, the other little piece of the puzzle is that in the 1990s, Cadillac also becomes an advisor to movies that are made, to books that are being written. 
And of course, in the early 2000s, we start to see, actually, actually after Whitney Webb gave a couple of her interviews, I got, a, I got some of my friends and we saw some television shows and some movies that Webb mentioned in her interviews that there was a, uh, well, the movie Contagion, for example. And then there was another series in the early 2000s that, that used the term lockdown or that, or that <clears throat> used the whole idea of a dark winter. And these, these movies and these television series, they started planting in our imagination Right, the whole idea of fear of a contagion. Even, even right now, even the, even the, the, the current variant that we're all dealing with, Omicron. There have been science fiction movies, both from the 1960s, and even as recently as 2013, using Omicron as some sort of foreign alien uh, invaders <laughs> that are out to get us. So, the whole point. I, what what I what I really appreciated from the series that Whitney Webb Whitney Webb outlined is that there are very there are people who by the time you get to the 1990s early 2000s there are people who know and they seem to be on the one hand they seem to be Bill Gates I, I was that's in the back of my mind that just in the last two or three weeks of course. We we have seen articles, and I sent you links to these articles about a, a Bill Gates talking about the next pandemic we're going to get is a smallpox outbreak. And then, of course, just two or three weeks ago, there was an article that appeared one day of smallpox be, having a, escaped from a lab somewhere in the United States. Right? These are all little things where they're planting <clears throat> they're planting seeds. So Whitney Webb, Whitney Webb wrote last in, in April and May of 2020, and she gave a series of interviews in which she basically said she thinks that at some point they're going to try to roll out the dark winter, right? And the dark winter would be some sort of fear of a contagion, that, and that fear of the contagion would be so great that it would, it would lead to a lockdown kind of greater than the lockdown we've already gone through, which would be a kind of excuse for a kind of tyrannical, fascist, tyrannical, totalitarian governmental system, if you right? Could, being kind of imposed on us. If this, and what's sorry. interesting, and then just one, one more point before you get to your question, which is that, so last year in the presidential debate, I actually, I, I actually gave a series of lectures in the summer of 2020 on dark winter and to, to very skeptical audiences, I have to admit. But, Last year in the presidential debate, one of the candidates basically said, we got to take this thing seriously, because if we don't, we're headed for a dark winter. <laughs> and, then, and then also now you've seen, you've seen it come up a, a few times in the last month. right? Once again, the rhetoric coming out of Washington, D.C. of we might be headed for a dark winter. And now you see it in the headline this morning. Dark winter is set for Pennsylvania. And for me, for me, this is not something where I hear this and I go, ah, oh, this is terrible. This is exactly what my professor described in the early 1990s. This is how seeds are planted in media and especially in headlines, because they knew already by the, already by the 1960s, 1970s, they knew that most people, when they read anything in a major newspaper, they read the headlines, maybe the first paragraph. Right, so for me, all of this, these scenarios, and it's also we we spoke about this, I think, before that this this project for a new American century document. It even speaks about uh, bioweapons attacks, bioterror attacks, as being something that the government needs to be ready for to respond to, uh, just like it might need to be ready to respond to a new Pearl Harbor type event in order for America to maintain its greatness in the, in the 21st century. So as far as I'm concerned, the dark winter, it's just an example of what my professor taught me in college. I, I feel that 
this is one of the few instances where I did actually get something out of my college education. And <laughs> people are saying a lot these days, right? That, that most of your education, you're actually not going to get anymore in college. You're going to get on well, shows like yours and finding other individuals who make it their business to get to the truth. Sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. I knew you were, um, you were going somewhere, but, um, I just, it's, it's kind of like been popping around a bit in the news as well. Like that, that young girl in Australia who was put into, um, uh, one of those, I don't know what they call them. Um, concentration camps. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I thought I, I, the idea of it was kind of like, I remember we did speak in Rome about these FEMA camps and like I had a buddy in, in Seattle who was really big into like, you know, these these camps that the government has. And I just always thought, look, it was a bit far-fetched, but just a couple of days ago, this girl in Australia, she was she was a close contact, someone who had COVID and she had said that she she had gotten the test, ended up, you know, not getting the test, whatever, but she ended up getting put in a van and brought to uh, one of these, these camps where she had to be for two weeks. And there's videos yeah. she's taken there of it, which it's not far fetched anymore. You want to just make me bring that into it a bit? Like FEMA, what does that mean? What are these? Are these are these even real? Is this even a possibility? Yeah, when I was in Rome, I remember reading articles about how, and we I, I remember we discussed them uh, about how FEMA was was getting camps, basically was making camps. The idea, and those who were concerned at the time. They were saying, well, on the one hand, you could understand how a FEMA camp could be useful if there were some sort of great disaster, some sort of hurricane or some sort of great disaster like that, that half wiped out a city. You could understand how a camp like that could be used in a good way to help people who essentially are refugees for a time. Is, is FEMA just like, a, is that, it just for people who wouldn't know the term, it's just in, it's for when there's emergencies, there's the government's body. It's, yeah, it's a, basically, it's a federal agency for emergency management. It's, I think it's the Federal Emergency Management Agency. I think that's, I think actually that's what it is, for a Federal Emergency Management Agency, right? So obviously there's, there's, this is always the difficulty with discussing any political institution that political institutions can be used and they, they have a legitimate purpose. Uh, even, even things like the right, even things like the right of self-defense or war, these are all legitimate options that go individuals and governments have that can be used if just, if in the service of the common good. The difficulty, as we, as we know this going back to the beginning of time, the, the difficulty is that anything, any created good because of original sin and the effects of original sin, any created good can be turned to the use of evil. It can be it can be turned towards someone's someone's power, someone's pleasure, someone's sense of sense of self esteem in a disproportionate way. <clears throat> so that's always the question with these things. It's not to it's not to say outright you can never have any kind of a camp to help anybody in a time of need. But there's always a danger that there be some, that somebody has a plot of some sort. And oftentimes these plots, they can be even well-meaning plots, but that are, they're, they're one of the effects of original sin too, is we all have distorted intellects. We all have a, we can all develop distorted notions of the good and and we can also develop distorted notions of how to pursue the good. That's that's the problem with Machiavellianism, or utilitarianism, or various sorts of materialism that seem to drive the oligarchs who rule the world these days, or who seem to want to rule the world from places like the World Economic Forum. Right? They have some notion of the good, and it's it's a false notion of the good. And because, but they also have very utilitarian, at best utilitarian, at worst Machiavellian ways of thinking about how to achieve the good that they that they have in their mind, and so they're willing to use. It. And so it's uh, we see this happening now in Australia, and it's going to start happening. I mean, it, it's not. I, I think in the United States it, it might not happen everywhere. I think there's there's enough pushback at this point. And the pushback is gaining steam that, but what we're seeing now is we're seeing as part of the rollout of the times that we're in, 
this this fear i mean fear can lead fear is an incredible motivator <laughs> Our Lord says, don't fear the one who can kill your body. Fear the one who can take your soul and cast it into hell. Well, it seems like going back to Thomas Hobbes, modern societies, even or Machiavelli even, modern societies are built on fear, garnering fear, garnering fear of the unknown. In order, and there seems to have been a very sophisticated science that's been developed by our governments, by our world leaders, how to use fear of the unknown virus, how to use fear of the unknown in order to develop policies <clears throat> that, that I think on some level they must think are going to be good, good for somebody, maybe good just for them, or the good, the good few who survive, or maybe some other interest groups that they have in mind for the good, but fear is the motive. Fear is what they're using to, con to fear has always going back to the ancient world. Fear. I saw the Nuremberg code thing also. Yeah. Fear is what is used to control populations. Well, that's funny how you're saying it. And you mentioned Webb's articles on like how these things are planted in there. I think it was in October last year, Michael Bay came out with a, a movie Songbird and I haven't seen it, but I just like, you know, it's just basically seen the trailer and they told me about it, but it's basically the situation where just like this, this variant comes out. It's like COVID. I don't know what they name it. COVID something. And the, the, these guys show up at people's houses with hazmat suits. And if they're, if they've yeah. been, you know, in some kind of contact, they bring them to these, these camps and stuff. And you, you're yeah. watching. Yeah. I mean, I can see a lot of people getting terrified seeing that, you know, just watching that. But, um, we don't, we don't, you know, it's funny when I was growing up, the only people that wrote, the only people that seemed to write about, there's a lot of things that in these last couple of years that made me rethink some of the things that I've re I've read or some of the concepts I was given growing up. So for example, when I was growing up, it was only like crazy leftists that would critique interest group, the, the influence of interest groups and corporations and democracy. Right. Well, well, now I think that I think those people now, I think they had they had they were saying something. They were saying something. Or when I was growing up, it was only crazy leftists who would write about the influence or the collaboration between the CIA and Hollywood. Well, but now it's pretty clear on, on so many of these films. Michael Bay is a, is a great is a great example of it. Angelina Jolie. I mean, we could start to list on a number of these films, the Batman films, the Marvel films, there's always collaboration. There's always collaboration. It's, it, there's, there's a kind of subtle, the thing is, it's easy to critique these things, the way they were done in kind of ham-fisted ways in, totalita in the totalitarian societies of the 20th century, or at least we, we portray them as being ham-fisted. But there's 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 all sorts of collaboration that goes on between Hollywood and the CIA and the oligarchs. And of course, when I, when, when I was growing up, it was only crazy leftists that wrote about these things. So and, and people would always tell us, oh, those crazy leftists, they're communists. Well, well, now now it's the leftists who are part of this whole collab network of collaboration. And if anybody raises these things, they get labeled conspiracy theorists, right? <laughs> so what would you say? Would right? you say that, like, this all being said, are we on, like, I know people have been predicting and saying, you know, like Bill Gates, was it was in 2015, that TED Talk, that, you know, there's going to be a, a big one coming, you know? Like, is there yeah. biological warfare on the horizon and uh, have we been just being prepared for this or like, what would you say is your opinion? Or is it just like to get us all terrified and basically see how they can? Well, look, I just say, let's go, let's go to the project for a new American century document. We don't, we don't, we don't have to go any farther than the project for a new American century. That document written in the late 1990s, it told us <clears throat> that there would be a Pearl Harbor like event that would help us to kind of get involved in the Middle East. It told us that we would that we would be involved in destabilizing countries like Iraq, Somalia, Yemen, Syria, and eventually Iran. And of course, Iran is now the country that's in the crosshairs of 
the oligarch, the deep state, whatever you want to call it, right? The military industrial complex. The Project for a New American Century document told us there is going to be some sort of bioweapon attack that would require a response. So <clears throat> however you want to describe it, I've, I was also thinking, you know, we have to be careful, right? I mean, we Catholics, though, we're used to this going back to the Roman Empire. We had ways of going back to the Roman Empire of using Daniel and the three young men in the fiery furnace, using Jonah and the whale. I mean, you know how to use symbols to talk about the reality that we're facing with euphemisms. I know during the Spanish Civil War, St. Jose Maria would write letters to his to his uh, collaborators, and he knew that they were there was going to be censorship, so he had to use euphemisms to speak about. So he, when he, you, you, a euphemism for the Eucharist was the House of Emmanuel, the House of our Brother mm -hmm. Emmanuel, right? I mean, we we have to use euphemisms, unfortunately, to speak about these things because, well, now the algorithms are in the form of uh, now there's censored algorithms, or maybe we get reported by people or whatnot, but. The Project for a New American Century, it's, it's a prophetic document. It's, a, it's, a, it's at the least, maybe we don't want to say it's prophetic, but certainly there's a number of things that, have said that, it, that it has said that has come true, right? That have now come true. And so it's not, it wouldn't, I don't think it would surprise anybody at this point <clears throat> if these smallpox news stories grow and develop into something else. When when will it occur? Will it will it be five years? Will it be a year, two years, five years? I mean, they've they've kind of already indicated to us that we're in for a ten year, we're in for a ten year roller coaster ride when it comes to uh, the events we've experienced the last couple of years. I think the big question is in the United States. I think the big question is through the law courts, will and and in Western societies. Will there be enough pushback that leads them to rethink some of these things that they have they've planned to roll out? Uh, I don't know, but I don't you know I can't I can't predict the future. Yeah, no, but it is in the air, and it's just sometimes hard to tell. Like whether this is just the like you said, the sophists, our modern day sophists, trying to get us terrified so that they can kind of you know <laughs> put a fear into us. I would say this. When when people talk about 9-11, I think it's very clear. There's two there's two things, right? One thing is what actually happened on 9-11, right? What are the actual facts of what happened on 9-11? The other thing is what did the government do as a result of 9-11? And there were all sorts of, there were all sorts of, there's, you know, the, the Department of Homeland Security. There were all sorts of governmental programs that were written in the late 1990s. And once 9-11 happened, it's clear these things were rolled out. They were, but they were all written before 9-11. So in part, <clears throat> we can distinguish between what actually happened. You know, A led to B, B led to D, C, C led to the events of the day. And then what was in place to roll out once what actually happened happened? So, for example, we know we know we know that the uh, the whole idea of the Great Reset. You know these these leaders, whoever it is that collaborates with the World Economic Forum or whatever group of of interest that the World Economic Forum represents, we know they had something like the Great Great Reset planned out, and we know that we know already that last June. In June of 2020, they started. There were individuals that started giving public statements about, well, the pandemic is going to be an opportunity for us for for carrying out X, Y, and Z as far as transforming societies according to our good, <laughs> whatever we think our good is. I think one of the phrases was, "By 2030, you'll own nothing and you'll yeah. be happy." For example, right? So, so we can distinguish between. Getting into the nitty gritty, which I, I think it's interesting if we can get into the nitty gritty, but we have to be careful about how we get into the nitty gritty because of censorship. But it, it can be interesting to get into the nitty gritty about, well, how did the whole thing happen? 
what role did Robert Cadillac play in it? What role did Bill Gates play in it? Where does it really come from? What is Fort Detrick, Maryland? What came out of Fort Detrick, Maryland? You know, how did what kind of collaboration was going on between scientists and the NIH and people in China and whatnot? I mean, that's all interesting. And then there's another question. Once that's happened, what are the politicians? What are the people who the politicians are representing? What are they trying to do <laughs> over the next 10 years or so? So this is an investment, obviously. Like these guys are, these guys do, as you were saying, like the these things are kind of like structures that have been slowly just being built and put into place and kind of like deadlines being made. So we're just, yeah. And just because we are wrapping up, um, that really flew. Um, I mean, there's a couple of things here that you had. Maybe I'll just leave them in the description. I think a lot of people would be interested in a lot of these articles. Um, Whitney Webb will definitely put that in there as well. But um, yeah. what would you say now to people? Um, because like be the knowledge that this is something that they really would like to create in us fear um, as a priest at the end of the day, because we're priests. Um, what would be your your answer there just as far as in the face of, of the of the fear mongering and, and everything that's going on right now? No, Do you know what I'm going to say? Fear is useless. <laughs> what is needed is love. <laughs> Love casts out all fear. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> <laughs> no, precisely, precisely. It's, it's, uh, we have to, I think one of the good things that's coming out of all this is that we're, we're learning that in the face of fear, the worst thing you can do is let fear be become the motive of your action, right? In the face of fear, you have to learn what you love. You have to learn and you have to make a determined choice. So the, the kind of love that our Lord had was agape, which is a determined choice to do the good. Right? That, in other words, a choice knowing the difficulties, knowing the problems, knowing all of the knowing all of the challenges that we face. We make a determined choice to do the good in the relationships that we can. And obviously for some lay people, it's part of this is gonna be getting involved in social life and civic life and politics in a way so as to do the good for many souls and to, to, to achieve the common good. But <clears throat> I think what, one of the things that we're all waking up to in these last couple of years is that we have, what are the relationships it's worth making this determined choice to do the good for them? Yeah. And and maybe maybe there's some relationships we've neglected that we need to invest more in at this moment. Right? Or in the time be given the times that we're in. I also think James Corbett, by the way, he's another individual I highly respect and I highly recommend his website uh for all of the topics that we've been discussing today, but also he has started a a little segment of his website is called Solutions Watch, in which he he tries to point to good things that he thinks people are doing right now in the circumstances that we find ourselves in. That, you know, it could be as simple as finding out who are the people closest to you that are farming in a way that's sustainable. Which, I mean, it kind of seems like, it could seem almost like a silly thing, but... For, for for so many centuries, for, for so much of human existence, one of the most fundamental relationships that we had was between the people of the community and the local farmer or the local farmers. It, 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 apparently, uh, there, in societies that are still very traditional and people live long, healthy, happy lives, one of the things that education is super important also, but one of the things that seems to be part of uh, a real happy life is establishing these relationships, for example, with local farms, right? These are the people that feed you when everything else falls apart. No, it's, <laughs> it's actually hilarious that you say it because we're, we just met um, a couple that they, we got a bit into like what they're doing and 
they're even uh they made their own filters with this weird kind of carbon that they found and they're drinking the rainwater and they make absolutely everything like 100 percent self-sufficient they're yeah. even the the whole solar panel stuff like it's hilarious that you just mentioned this because we just we're just talking to this couple like on it's, and and, I, and again, also, it's not that it's not that difficult to to start to do simple things on your own that don't cost a lot of money, but then you know, and that can lead you and your neighbors and whoever to start to have relationships based on this one common thing that we all share: this need to eat. It's true. Well, look, Father, thank you for that. Um, it was uh, it was interesting as always, you know the backgrounds, and I hope people really do take advantage of it. And the what I get out of these as well is just the desire to uh, to dig a bit more and to get more formed and just to get you know a bit of a background, um, just like you said the the living memory and all that stuff of just as far as like the situation we're living in today is not new. There's nothing really new. Um, it's just a bit di- different as far as the appearance, but just to get more interest in formation and and where to go so hopefully please god we can continue with these just to give people you know just mentioning names like you did today is 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 already is already huge so people can start doing the digging themselves so but um if you want you can maybe we can end with a prayer and your blessing good hail mary full of grace the lord is with thee blessed art thou among women and blessed is the fruit of thy womb jesus Pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Glory be to the Father and to the and Son and the to the Holy now, Spirit. Ever shall be world without end. Amen. May God, the Father of mercies, be in your heart, in your mind, and on your lips. In the name of the Father and of the Amen. Son and of the Holy Spirit. Bless you guys. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Ha, 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 ha.